Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. What you're about to hear is what I think a really phenomenal conversation, really phenomenal interview with Fernando Reyes. You're about to hear a really, really inspiring story and just a really cool conversation on just the music industry in general. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. My name is Jacob Restituto, and today I have the absolute pleasure of having Fernando Reyes here on the channel for an interview. Thank you so much, Fernando, for taking the time. I'm really looking forward to talking to you. I hear it all about your story, man. Same, man. Thank you for having me. I love your content, so I'm very happy to be here. Perfect. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. So um, for people that aren't super familiar with your story, can you give a little back, bit of backstory and you know how you got essentially into the music industry? And I know that you're uh, originally from Peru, so how you know you, what made you decide to make that trip over from Peru to America, all the different things. So I'd love to hear your story. Yeah, man. So uh, I'm a mixing engineer. I am originally from uh, Lima, which is the capital of Peru. I... Like a lot of engineers that I know started uh, with music when I was like, you know, a teenager, I was like playing guitar and I was like playing in bands. So by the time I finished high school, I didn't really know what to uh, do, but I had to go to uni because, you know, parents yeah. parents wanted to, of course. So I was like, all right, I guess I'll get into music school. I didn't really know what I wanted to do in music school, but I was like, that's what I've been doing for the last few years, just like playing music and like, I guess I'll figure it out. So I went to music school. I met a friend who's, who's a great friend of mine. Um, and he was recording. It was like the very early stages of music school. So we like didn't know anything, but like he was like recording his guitar through like a little like, uh, you know, M box or whatever. <laughs> and I was like, I just thought that was just like the coolest thing in the world because I had never had any sort of interaction with engineering or recording or anything. So I was like, that's dope. So I paid him to give me lessons every Saturday. So he would teach me Pro Tools for a couple of hours. Now, but by the time that we got into some production classes at school, which was like like two years later. Really? So you went I to music school like, and then even into two years into the music school, it took like to get to the production part of it. Yeah, because it was like a very like, you know, general music school. So I was taking like guitar classes because that was my instrument, but I, I was taking like composition and like orchestration and like sure. lots of stuff. Yeah. So when we got to uh, the production classes, I had already been recording just like, you know, friends and like my band and my house. Like I, I got an inbox, I got a Mac, I got like a couple of speakers. So I think at that point I was like, all right, this is, this is what I want to do. Like seriously. So I evaluated cause in Peru, the, the, the undergrads are five years. So I was like, is it worth it for me to stay here for another five years? Just sort of like learning a, a lot of good stuff, but like stuff that in the end I probably won't use like advanced orchestration, composition and that stuff. Or should I sort of like just drop out and maybe move to a different school? So that was when I had a conversation with my parents and I was like, listen, this is what I want to do. There's not really like a vast industry in Peru and there is no you know, specialized engineering schools. And I could go the route of just self-learning, but I really want to have like a proper education. So I started evaluating options. And then, you know, at the end, I decided to go to Full Sail University in Orlando, Florida. And that was a big move because I wasn't just leaving home for the first time to go to college. I was leaving my country, I was leaving my family, I was leaving my friends, I was leaving my culture, and I had just turned 20, so I was like, a little bit scared, for sure, yeah, for but sure, uh, man. I did it, and I, I moved to Orlando, and, you know, even besides any of, like, the professional or, like, the engineering stuff, just, like, have, just, like, doing that move and having to face the world on my own just made me grow up, like, as a human being, you know, as a person, sure. just have to take care of yourself and deal with your own stuff and not having, you know, mom and dad to solve anything for you. Just like, it's really like a big, like shock at the beginning, but I feel like that's where, when we really like mature, you know? So anyway, I went to school, did two years of school. It's a pretty short program. First of all, I decided where I wanted to go. I wanted to, I decided I wanted to go to New York city. Hmm. To me, it, it's really like, you know, LA or New York. Uh, Atlanta, Nashville, Miami, if you're like into like, you know, specific genres. But I was like, all right, for me, really, it's like LA or New York. LA, 
is too close to Florida in terms of weather, and I'm done with the sun for a while. So <laughs> let me let me try New York. You know, for sure, um, I relate to that very much. So as a as a, as a native born New Yorker, I relate to that very much. So exactly. So I had just started dating this girl at the time. Um, who was actually now my wife, eight years later. She was like, I'm also going to go to New York and try it out. Like we, she, we, we met at school. She's also like an, an engineer. So we rented like a, like a budget truck and like load up like our college bedrooms and just like drove straight like 22 hours or something, just straight to New York. We had like rented an apartment. We got in and then I had been sending resumes we have both been sending resumes to like different studios in the city she wanted to do mastering plot twist my wife is a mastering engineer at uh, sterling sound for sure uh, shout out to sterling sound had some great interviews with sterling yeah. sound people shout out to sterling uh that's like our second family mm. so anyway i had i had landed an internship at uh, electric lady studios which was funny because i had literally emailed every single studio like in the city or in brooklyn and nobody replied to me but Electric Lady. And Electric Lady was one of those where, like, that's probably, like, too big a studio. Like, I'm just sending it just, you know, just to see what happens. But I was really aiming to, like, towards a smaller studio. And the only one that replied was Electric Lady. The I had only an one. And yeah. Yeah. So I want to give a little context for people that aren't super familiar with the music industry and the recording industry. Electric Lady is probably one of the most iconic studios in the city, in New York City. Maybe there's a handful of others within the city, but like Electric Lady, I mean, if you you can share some of the names that have performed there, but I mean, one of the first ones that, that you know, pop off the head is, I mean, believe, I think Jimi Hendrix recorded there in the 60s and stuff, right? Like he, well, he, he founded the studio. That's okay, his yeah, studio. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, exactly. Yeah. You know, so, uh, yeah. but it's it's an iconic, iconic studio. So, like, it's not like you got into some little mom and pop, you know, indie record label studio. You got into one of the biggest studios in the city. Absolutely. <laughs> which was, which was very, like, daunting and very, like, crazy. But <laughs> so, I, I would I love there, to hear that experience. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, for sure. So, so I got in and, you know, I was, I was an intern doing, you know, paying my dues, like everyone, like doing coffee runs and, you know, tidying up the studios or whatever. And then Electric Lady has like a pretty big, or at least when I was there, I don't know how it is now, but they had like a pretty big like roster of interns. So it would be like, we're probably like 15 interns and it would be like three, three interns per shift. And it would be like a day shift and a night shift. Define day so, and night. Like how late does the night shift go? <laughs> well, the day shift would run from like 9 a.m. to like 6 p.m. <laughs> and the night shift would run from 6 p.m. to closing time, which is open-ended, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. So a lot of the times you're, you would see that they could come in the next day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, it's crazy. Were you on the night shift or the, or the uh, day shift, or is it rotating? It was rotating, so you would usually get like a couple a couple different shifts, like you know, two, two day shifts and then two night shifts a week. I was usually doing like four days a week. But... I was young and I was very excited and I was hungry and I had stamina. So it was all good. I would <laughs> now in my thirties, I would not survive those shifts, but um, it was all good. So yeah, you know, I was like doing like those, those kind of like, you know, little jobs. And then the thing with, with a studio like that is that even if you, if, even if you are one of like the best interns, it really comes down to timing because a lot of the times they might like you and you and you might be doing a great job, but there's just no open positions and there's no opportunity to get hired. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I'm from Peru. So I, I came here with a student visa when I and then after you finish your studies, you get like a like a one year like grace period to like try to see to like get some um, you know it's for like getting experience but obviously if you get hired you can get like a work visa so i was like i have a year to try to make it or i'm just going back home yeah so i i had that pressure on me that maybe like an american would not have you know yeah so i did my three months and i did them the best i could and i i was you know you can get the feeling because i was I was always hanging with staff and I knew they liked me sure. and they would like, they would hand pick me for like specific jobs that maybe like the other interns wouldn't have, or they would like get me into like a room to like help the assistant engineer, like set something up, stuff like that. 
So when my three when my three month period came to an end, I knew I had something. Be, I had built something there, but there were no openings. Sure. So I, I was like, all right, I gotta like accept reality. So I gotta start trying to apply into other studios. Now that I maybe have this experience, I can like try to like get into another for one. Sure, for sure. But I was like. I can either like just stop my internship at, at the three month mark because that's usually like the cycle and go out and try to get, you know, a different internship or I can see if they can let me stay on a bit longer so I can keep getting some experience. And then on my days off, I'll, I'll keep, you know, going around and dropping off resumes or whatever. So they were cool with me just staying. And that was really like decisive because a month after, a, a position opened up and I got hired. So, yeah. yeah that's timing. amazing, man. Yeah. That's it's all about timing. So, so to recap it, essentially, you, you came went from Peru, went to Full Sail. From Full Sail, you got a miraculous internship, internship at, at, at uh, Electrical Lady Studios. Now, was that, how does the internship work? Is that, um, you said there was about 15 people, but are they, is it unpaid internship? Is it a paid internship? You said for about three months, correct? Yes, it's a three month unpaid internship. Okay, cool. And then from there, you asked if you could essentially stay for a little bit longer to get a little more experience, and you were going to kind of search around for other internships in, in the meantime. And a month later, yep. you ended up getting it open, a position open up, and you became uh, a part of the staff. Yes, that's correct. It's remarkable, man. All about timing, all about great, all about connections too, though. It's, uh, I mean, full sale it, it, with even uh, alone in itself within the music industry is a very uh, well-known school so so yeah. like even just going there you know it, it kind of builds a little bit of, of like you know expectation of what, what you're going to come out of school with to some degree oh 100 percent. and like the the i didn't get my job from school but i built connection like i, I met my wife yeah. who's also my mastering engineer to yeah. this day right <laughs> and i made i made some great friends yeah who went on to being very successful producers and who hired me for mixing up to this day and we were hanging and drinking at full sale so you it you make that sort of personal uh connections yeah that you that if you nurture them you know then they they, they become also business connections you know for sure absolutely man it's all about relationships hands down for sure relationships and like it's it's all about like the vibe you know what i mean because like mm. every everybody who who graduates from like a school like Full Sail or Berkeley, like a potential employer, expect them to know the uh, have a solid foundation of the basics of engineering. Um, anyone anyone can learn the technical. Anyone, but if you're about to be in an enclosed space with a bunch of people in a very high demanding, high pressure, fast paced environment for 15 hours a day. It doesn't matter that much how much you know versus the other person. It just it, it matters more how you are as a person and that they can trust you, they can rely on you, and that you're just a good time to be around. You're a professional. You know how to distinguish different scenarios. Yeah. When to be a fly in the wall, when to be playful, when to be whatever. You know what I mean? That that is I think that a lot of people don't think about it that way and I think that is crucial. Yeah, it's it's essentially um, the the IQ versus EQ, you know, the in, uh, intelligence of general, just knowing the the tech versus the emotional intelligence of like, hey, I should probably shut up now, or hey, you know, this is a good time to offer to do something, or just kind of stay in the background, or you know, catch the vibe that this guy's not in a good mood. So I, you know, whatever the case is, so it's the IQ and EQ are yeah. very, very, very important, and to some degree. Uh, like kind of like what you're saying, I, I, if I'm understanding properly, is like to some degree even EQ, meaning emotional intelligence, could be even more important sometimes than emo uh, technical intelligence because technical intelligence can kind of be learned. You know, you can go into the studio and and learn that stuff as opposed to being like, yo, this guy's great technically, but I don't like being around him. It's not going to get you very far. Oh, and and I've been across that sort of people a lot where like I can, I clearly see that this person has much more technical experience, but I just don't like being around them. I much rather put in the work hmm. to train some more, some someone who maybe doesn't know as much, but who I just have a great time being around and I just feel good being around, you know, hands down. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. It's such a good point. 
So speaking about uh, being around people and relationships in the industry, I'd love to hear, this is super just curious, uh, how it works with both you and your wife being both in the industry. Uh, as both cre- as, as the creatives, I'm curious if that, you know, do you talk creativity in the household or do you not? Like, for example, my wife is a, a labor and delivery nurse. So we, ha- we use very different uh, parts of our brains. I'm the creative. She's very, you know, scientific, essentially, you know, so it's very different yeah. and our work is very, very different. I'm curious how it is as, you know, married to us, to, to somebody in the, in the industry. Um, if you, I just love to hear your perspective. Yeah, I think we've been very lucky in that regard because this is a tough, a tough industry, especially when you're first starting out, uh, the, the little pay or the no pay, <laughs> the long hours and like somebody who maybe has like a more traditional job wouldn't understand why you're doing what you're doing. And it, it was just very important for us to always have each other's back because we just understood what the other one was going through. Um, and then from like a more like technical standpoint, it, it's been great seeing her develop her career as a master engineer and see her incredible progression in these eight years. And she's had the same with me as a mixing engineer. And it's just funny because like, our jobs are like pretty much like interrelated so we've had like a little insight into another world like a lot of mixing engineers maybe don't really mm. understand exactly what goes on yeah behind the curtains in mastering and i've had i've been able to pick that at the arguably the best mastering studio in the world because like sure. i said like sterling has literally the best engineers but they're like they're like old friends we we yeah. just hang you know we just they come to our house and we're, we're just friends. So I've had the luxury of having that. And then she as a mastering engineer also has the inside of like the mixing perspective and what a mixer is expecting when we get a mastering. And like, she's asking me like countless questions like about like, why would a mixer do this? Or like, why would like, you know, whatever it is. And I, and same, same with me, like why, why does it happen in mastering or like, how is this going to affect what I'm doing? So it's just been very enriching for our careers to have like each each other's in in our corners, you know. Yeah, that, that's a great perspective. Absolutely, you get a whole another look at things that people might not uh, get to see. That's really cool, for sure. At, you know, two yeah. huge. Are you still with Electric Lady, or are you? Uh... No, so so. Let, I'll go back to the story. So I I was at Electric Lady. I was working for Electric Lady for the studio for like about a year and a half. Um, I first they hired me like as a what they call a general assistant, and then eventually I became an assistant engineer. Now, now at the time, uh, Michael Brower, who for those who don't know is like a very famous mixing engineer, he he's done like you know Coldplay, Parachute, X and Y, Viva La Vida, John Mayer, Battle Studies, Continuum, James Bay, The Cooks, Empire of the Sun, Aretha Franklin, Luther Vandross, <laughs> Rolling. Stones, Bob Dylan, like you name it. Um, he was renting Studio B, Electric Lady, and that was his mix room. So one day I was doing my shift at Electric Lady, and from his uh, from his I- engineer at the time, and he's like, "Hey man, like, can you swing by Studio B when you finish your shift?" And I'm like, uh, "Sure." So I go down and. We had a, a conversation and essentially they asked me if I was interested in joining Brower's team. And I was like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> because like Electric Lady was like a, a like an entry point for me. But I, I've i always wanted to be a mix engineer. I, I, I never really wanted to do recording for mm-hmm. a long term. So that was just perfect. And then I started working with Brower. I worked with Brower for first for two years at electric lady and then michael was deciding he had been there for nine years and he decided it was time to move on and he moved out of electric lady because at that point we were fully analog so we were running like an 80 channel ssl console huge (laughs) stack of gear so you know with with the with the evolving with the times he decided to go hybrid so he still kept his gear but he decided to stop mixing in the in the console so we moved he was like i'm moving to like a private room basically my own place 
and he wanted to take me with him. And at that point, I have been in his team for two years. And as much as I loved Electric Lady, that was my pathway to becoming a mixer. So I, I went with him. We moved out of Electric Lady. Um, we went to this private studio probably for a couple of years. And then the pandemic hit. And then we were forced to go to lockdown. But that sort of showed showed him a forced uh, adaptation of the benefits of working in the box. Mm-hmm. So uh, that 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 was basically a few months of him adapting to like a fully in the box workflow with me helping him out, setting this this big template that sort of mimic like what he had going on in you know in the hardware world. Eventually, he got very comfortable, and then sort of when like the pandemic started, like you know, getting better, we had a conversation, and we just decided it made sense to commit to what we were doing. So he gave up the lease on the new studio. He sold like three quarters of his gear, wow. and he had set up his studio in in the basement of his house, and he was like, "I'm just gonna like." This is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just fully commit to this. And at that point, I had moved out of New York City, just across the river. We moved to Fort Lee, New Jersey, which happens to be like literally like a three minute drive from Sterling Sound, yeah. so my wife can go to work every day. <laughs> um, and I moved out of a little apartment, and we moved into a house. And I also built my uh, mixing setup in my basement, hmm. and, and we were working remotely. And I still work with Michael to this day in, in, a, in a different capacity. Um, we co-mix Dolby Atmos projects together. Like we, so I've been with him for like over seven years. So we have like, we've, we have like a very like close relationship. Um, so when Dolby Atmos came around, we decided to partner up and we co-mix Dolby Atmos projects together. And in parallel, for the last few years, I had been building my mixing career parallel to me working with Michael. And, you know, thankfully, I started getting like busier and busier and getting more clients. So sort of reached the point where I was like, I need to step out from working with Michael full time. So we started train. We started finding a, a replacement for me, somebody I could train. You know, I won't get into details, but we had some bad luck, like, uh, you know, a lot of people who just, we would train and then they just didn't make the cut and they yeah. would like drop out and they would like start again, a new person, blah, blah. But, um, you know, we have a, we have a new assistant who's been with us for, uh, for like half a year now. So she's basically taken over like all the assistant engineer duties for Michael. Um, and I'm still around. I help out here and there when they need me with like more experienced stuff. And uh, I'm currently mixing a, an album in ad mode with Michael. But yeah, like mm. I had been build, building my mixing career on the side. So when when I sort of like stopped having as much responsibilities on Michael's operation, it allowed me to like put in more of my time and my focus into building my own thing. And that that's what I've been doing. I uh, I have a new manager shout out shout out to liz yeah absolutely uh, she's she's, hel- she's helping me you know build my whole operation and everything so that, that that's where i'm i love at it in 2023 i love it man yeah, honestly before we get any further in the conversation i want to i want to give you props in the sense of like uh, you're a great storyteller man i was on the edge of my seat the whole time like oh wow oh wow that's really oh wow you know it's just <laughs> one your story is very very cool um but two you tell it in a very way that's very engaging because i, I um and I've had some. I've had done a lot of these interviews, and so everybody's great to talk to. And I'm really grateful for all the people that have been a part. But some are better at telling stories than others. So I want to give you props that you are a very engaging storyteller. Um, but that being well, said, I, I, I appreciate oh, that. Yeah, absolutely, man, 100. percent I mean that. So I find that really the whole whole thing kind of very interesting, and there's a really great segues that I want to I, I want to kind of branch out into. But um, one that I find the most interesting is, is kind of breaking this like industry norm of. Uh, essentially like in the box mixing. Um, I find that super, super fascinating because I grew up essentially just in the box because that's all I could afford. You know, when I, I dropped out of college, I, I actually, a funny story is, is 
I've released a lot of music as a musician mm-hmm. and I have uh, like I, I do it all in my studio, my home studio, you know what I right? So that being said, though, I've never I never really one could really afford to go to a real studio. And two, like I kind of want to learn the process myself. But it's interesting, like it, 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 last night I, I, I was doing a little choir recording thing where like we built a little gospel choir for a track I was working on. And we're like, OK, let's go to a live room, you know, where we can actually get all the people in the room record like with all the mics and stuff. And it was interesting because it was one of my first times at like recording my own music in a real studio. And it's just interesting to see like, oh, wow, I've been I've been doing this for almost 10 years now, nine years this year. And like I've made it this far without having to go to a real studio. It's just very interesting to see how the world is kind of shifting away from that analog, you know, SSL console, all the hardware gear to everybody kind of just doing it at home. Uh, and it's just, I don't know. I just, I find that very interesting. Cause like as a kid, you're like, Oh, I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get to a studio. I gotta, you know, I gotta get to, um, all this gear and spend all this money on gear, but it's really not in the gear. It's in, uh, it sounds mad cheesy, but it's, it's in, it's in the ear, not the gear, you know? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. But that's the truth, man. And it's, it's, I just find that very, very fascinating for you. So do you mix fully in the box? I do mix full in the box, yes. So now, how does that work? Like, what do you? What does your typical um, template look like in the sense of like you're mixing in Pro Tools, and then you get a session of stems essentially, and then yeah. what do you do from there? Yeah. So, so basically, like the mixer's role has shifted from like say ten years ago, ten fifteen years ago, where like the band would record, produce the song, and it was like the the you know what what people think was the right way was like we're gonna strip everything down and give it to the mixer because the mm-hmm. mixer knows better right mm-hmm. we're gonna put the the volumes down put the pants at zero send a session clean to the mixer the mixer knows better but that doesn't work in 2023 with modern music because songwriting recording production even mixing are like all ingrained together as an artist producer mm-hmm. are creating a song they're making all of these sonic decisions, sound design, whatever it is, that is part of the identity of the song. So if I get a rough mix that has a sound that the artist and the producer already like, if I get a session that doesn't have any of that, it would be completely counterproductive because first, I'm going to waste all of this time trying to replicate what they already had. Most likely, I won't match it exactly. And then if I do something completely different, chances are they're going to be like, oh, like we like what we had, <laughs> yeah. right? So so my my way of working, which is, I would think, a lot of mixers nowadays way of working is getting printed tracks, right? Or aka stems. I know somebody somebody there in the comments is going to be like, it's not stems, even stems are only like mixed the stems, like after the mixing. <laughs> but like, you know just for the sake of this, like we can call it stems. Like, what do you call it before, before it's a stem? What's the, tech, what's the technical word? I, I honestly call it stems because it's easier for the clients to understand, <laughs> yeah. you know? Or I can be like, just print all your tracks in your session, process the way you have them, yeah. you know? So basically what, I am, what I'm trying to achieve is when I get the files from the client and I compare them to their reference mix, I should ha- they should sound pretty much exactly the same. So then what I do is from there, I can build, right? So I'm starting from where they left off. I'm, I'm starting from the foundation that they've created. And that gives me a clear direction of probably where they're trying to go with the vision. Obviously, yeah, if we talk on the phone or whatever. So from what they have, I can just take it to like the next level, you know? So when you get the printed mix, are you getting volume and everything panning and everything? How does that work? Yeah. I, I ask them for like everything, everything that they've, that they've done in the production. So like if they're, if they've played stuff with panning, bring it in. If they've done like a volume, right, bring it in. I don't, Mm. that doesn't detract from what I'm going to do as my job as a mixer. And that also doesn't really like tie my hand, Mm -hmm. you know? I can still do what I need to do, take it where I need to take it. And I usually also ask more so for like vocals. I will be like, also send me the vocals dry just as a precaution. You know what I mean? Mm. So a lot of the times I might, maybe I think what they did on the vocals or in the vocals is great. And I'm just going to build from that. 
sometimes I like it, but maybe I want to enhance it. So maybe I'll bring in the dry vocal and do my own thing and then blend both of them. Or uh, not too common, but maybe if I don't like what they had going on, I'll just discard their printed <laughs> stem and I'll just do my own thing with the dry. You know, mm -hmm. it just depends. Yeah. At the end of the day is a collaborative process, right? For sure. It, we are not working against each other. The producers or the producer shouldn't be pulling to, towards one direction and the mixer towards another direction. We're all supposed to be rowing in the same direction to make <laughs> the song the best it can be. So I'm not going to bring any ego or any problems or anything. I'm going to do the what I think is best for the song, making sure that it's in line with the artist's vision. Yeah, and that's how we get to the finish line, you know. So, how would you define what would, what would be your job essentially if you were to put a definition like a elevator pitch of this is my job as a mix engineer? A mix engineer. How would you define first of all your position? Mix engineer, mixing artist, mixing mix mixer. engineer, mixer, mix engineer, <laughs> mixing engineer, whatever, yeah. whatever it is. So you're in an elevator and you say, you know, somebody says, "What do you do?" Oh, I'm a mix engineer. And one line, what is your job? That's hard. Um, <laughs> All right. Is is the person in the elevator who's asking me, do they have any knowledge about the music industry or no? Two scenarios. One, yes. Other, no. The way I usually explain it for somebody who doesn't know anything about music is I use like a like a baking analogy. <laughs> so so I'm like the artist comes has the, the idea for like this great like cake and maybe he will hire a producer or if he's producing himself, they will go and create all the ingredients, right? So they will like get the eggs from the chicken and like, you know, get the flour and all this stuff and they would put everything together and they have a clear idea of where this is going. But then I will get all of those ingredients that they've created and I will put them in a bowl and mix them together <laughs> and, bake, and bake the cake, right? For sure. And then I have this baked cake and then it goes into mastering and then my mastering engineer, aka my wife, shout out, uh, <laughs> she'll get the frosting and put the frosting on top of the of the cake. That's, That's how I explain it. A you know? phenomenal, phenomenal uh, analogy. I love that. That's great. That's really cool. That's a cool way to explain the, the music industry process from, from yeah. know, conception to the to final product. And you as so, the, and then people as the consumers are the people that eat the whole cake at the end. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> it's a and phenomenal analogy. The cake, the cake goes to the shop. The yeah. shop might be like your, your streaming services. And then you as a consumer pay your fee and eat your cake. You know, <laughs> listen to your music. That's a great analogy. Now, I, what if, the alternative? What if somebody knows a bit about the music industry or music then in general? Then I would say, I would say I get the 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 production from the artist or the producer and they've crafted as far as they could sonically and it hopefully already sounds great but to take it to that next level that professional sound that commercial sound they're going to hire me to apply my my processes and my techniques and most importantly my taste and my experience to elevate what they have and give them a almost finished product mm, very interesting now i'm curious on on your perspective on this whole bedroom mixer concept in the sense of like now we you know 20 years ago let's go back to your cake analogy 20 years ago it was these big production facilities that would create you know all the cakes they come from these very you know well refined you know very expensive if you wanted to open your own like you know only only a couple of different flavors essentially of cakes coming out now 20 30 50, 40 50 years later um anybody can bake a cake there's an oven in every house essentially yeah and i'm curious on your perspective of like the traditional route of like sending your 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 ingredients to a, a mixer who then prepares the cake versus now a lot of the like especially with the whole rise of like tiktok and instagram and sh youtube shorts and stuff where a lot of people are doing it on their own um how do you see that that affects the industry i think there's validity in both approaches. Hmm. I think if you are a quote unquote bedroom producer, but you've spent time experimenting and you've really honed in your craft, 
there is no reason why you can't just mix your tracks on a laptop and headphones and have a great, great product, right? And the other side of the coin is there will always be professional mixers and we're always here to help any kind of artist. So if you're a mm. bedroom producer and you're crafting incredible vibes and maybe you're recording like your vocals, your guitar, and then you're programming a lot of stuff, especially with like pop music and you have an amazing song, but you don't have the experience to make it what it could be or what it should be, then we're here for you. Just send mm. us your tracks. We're going to retain your vibe and we're just going to make it sound how it should sound. So I, I think there's, I've heard people saying like, oh, the mixers are going to disappear. <laughs> like now everybody's doing it themselves. I don't think so. I think, I think there's room for everyone. There's enough music for everyone. As long as you're good at your job and you're good with people and you build relationships, then you're going to be okay. Absolutely. I, I, I do agree with that in the sense of even to some degree, um, record labels, for example, like, like, the record label, I think, industry might change, just perhaps like kind of like the mixing industry might adapt and change. But there, people are always going to need some sort of help in the sense of like, you know, there are handfuls of a couple people here and there that can do everything themselves. You know, like they're the entrepreneurial type, right? The Jay-Z's that like, you know, essentially start their own record label because they can they know how to do it themselves and they want to do, uh, do it for other artists. But then there are people that like don't know anything about anything and like always will need that help. You know what I mean? They're just a good songwriter. So now, you know, help me get to the next level kind of thing, you know? So that's, that's a great perspective. I appreciate that for sure. And I think one approach doesn't cancel the other one. Like yeah. there's big artists with a lot of budget that they can go to like these amazing studios and that's great. You know, they, they have the money to like pay for a bunch of time and just, they like the vibe of the studio, mm -hmm. like electric lady, huge artists pay for electric lady. Because the studio has crafted such an incredible vibe that it's very, you know, moving and it like feeds their creativity and like they obviously have these incredible sounding rooms and that's awesome. So it's not a diss on any of that. Like that will always For be sure. there. But then you have an artist like Phineas and Billie Eilish where they grew up making music in their parents' bedroom with like logic <laughs> and up to the, till this day on interviews I've seen. They don't like going to studios because they don't like the vibe. They do everything in their house. Still, they send it out to mixing, but they do everything in their house. And Billie Eilish's records sound incredible. The music is phenomenal. And they've won all the Grammys. Yeah. So, you know, that's a perfect I example. You. I hear you, man. It's a very, very, very interesting uh, uh, time to be alive. <laughs> For sure. I'm curious on your perspective as... Uh, now this is something I, I'm, I'm very interested in to ask in the sense of like as a musician being a musician has affected the way I f view music essentially in the sense of like whether I'm watching a movie whether I'm out to this is the worst like I can't go to a restaurant with live music because I'm just I'm it, it's like I'm not even there I'm just so distracted by the music good or bad you know like whether they're like it's right. just wow that sounds terrible or wow this is way too loud or wow this is phenomenal right so I'm curious like mm -hmm. what your perspective was on as a, as a as a mix engineer um just hearing music, you know, being like, oh, I would have done that very differently. Or, Ooh, that's that, you know, 20K is really harsh or or being like, wow, this is really good. Does, does it take away from your experience as a musician or as, as, a, as a listener of music? No, I don't think it takes away. I think if I put my, you know, my analyzing hat, mm -hmm. I can definitely be like, oh, damn, that's an interesting choice. Like that, those vocals are like really harsh. But then I can quickly just take that hat off and be mm -hmm. like, I can I can just enjoy the song. You know, so if I'm listening to a song I like or if I'm listening to something on the radio or whatever it is, there will always be that part of me that I can quickly identify <laughs> if it's quote unquote good or bad or if I like it or if I don't like the sonic decisions. But I can dissipate that and, and get through that and just enjoy just enjoy the music for yeah. what it is. I'm a huge for example, it's interesting because like we obviously we both love music, but like my wife, because she listens to so much music all day at her work she won't want to listen to music when she's at home. I'm the opposite way. I'm working on music all day, but I like the artists I like. I like the bands. I'm a music fan, you know? So if I'm cooking, <laughs> if I'm in the shower, if we're in the car, I'm always jam I'm putting jams and stuff that I like, you know what I mean? See, that's so funny. I re very much relate to your wife in the sense of like, outside. I, I leave the studio, I'm like, I want silence. I don't want to hear nothing. <laughs> it's too much. I get overstimulated. My wife likes blasting music upstairs when, you know, she's cleaning the house and the stuff. And I'm like, 
you know, like, okay, Google, lower the, you know, lower the music, <laughs> put the music to one, you know, <laughs> like, sure, sure, sure. Oh, I can't handle it, man. It's so funny. I don't know. It's just interesting personality types, but it's, it's too funny. Yeah. But I, one thing I, I, I want to, I want to be respectful of your time. And, and I have two more, two more questions for you. One, um, this is the technical, you know, question that I, I'm curious about, like, what are some of the, uh, the the tools that you enjoy using these days, whether it be plugins or you know effects or whatever the case is? Like, what do you what are you enjoying using? Not even necessarily that you think sound the best or anything. What like what's something that you like? This is a fun tool to use. Oh, so many. <laughs> um, first thing that comes to mind, probably the most boring, but like the most important element in any of my mixes. Fab Filter Pro Q3, so important. You know how many people uh, have I've... answered with that is very interesting. <laughs> I, I mean, I, in the I sense, think in the sense good. of like, that's a shout out to Fab Filter. Like, they made such a great product. Uh, no, I didn't mean that as a diss to you. I mean that as in like, wow, that's they made such a great product that so many people have responded saying Fab Filter. It's like, wow, like, oh yeah, how great of a product is this? You know that that a hundred percent. Yeah, it's it, it, it's the go to for pretty much everything. I've been enjoying. What have I been enjoying lately? There's this great plugin called the Oven by. Um, Plugin Alliance. I've been enjoying that in my mix bus. The God Party Call that Jason Joshua did with mm. Cradle Audio. I for for certain types of songs, I've been really liking that. I don't know. I mean, I love Valhalla stuff. The reverbs are phenomenal. How often Sound do you toys. find? Yeah, Sound Toys makes some great stuff. How often do you find you like? Do you find yourself wanting to try new plugins? Or do you are you often more like you know? Let me stick with what I have because there's so many options out there. Both. There's some plugins that come out and I, I I look at them and I'm like, oh, I'm really interested in that one. Let me check it out. And there's a lot of plugins that just sort of like just fly by me because I don't have the time to check everything that's coming out. Or if somebody recommends it, like maybe I will check it out. But I tend to be very comfortable with with my tools Hmm. and i think that's like very important because it gives you like efficiency and it makes you faster Mm -hmm. Uh, i'm also in a very privileged position because i still work with with michael and him being who he is we just get flooded with every new plugin (laughs) is sent our way for free (laughs) but that is also very overwhelming because it's like hey it is an let us know what you think. Like, and it's just like, sometimes we just don't have time to check it out. And then it's just like, Oh man, sorry. I don't have to, time to check it out. Yeah. Usually, usually we, we, we get them that way. And then for like, I don't know, every like 10, 20 new plugins that people are sending, like there'll be like one or two that will like stick, yeah. you know? Yeah, for sure. Very interesting. No, I, I appreciate that for sure. Um, and then lastly, you, uh, talking about just your, you, you in the industry, like, where do you see yourself going? Like, what what are some of your goals for the first for yourself in the industry? Maybe this is gonna get a little deep. Okay, let's hear it. But I want to hear it. I love it. I obviously being a mixer and and being an upcoming mixer, I have goals that probably most mixers have. You know, I would love to get a Grammy someday. I would want to work with like artists that I love, which I already do. Thankfully, I want to work with more artists that I love. I want to work with you know the top artists someday. Obviously, I want to you know be like one of the most recognized mixers in the world. But why I say it's going to get deep a little bit is because from what I've seen of some older engineers that to me maybe have already make it, quote unquote, make it, that I I see them and I'm like, man, that's where I want to be in 10 years, you know, in in 15 years. What, What I've seen on some of them is just that they maybe don't realize that they are there because they're in it every day. And it's just like another project and in the studio all the time. And like, even if they're working with like the best artists in the world, they might be like, if I'm not here like 24 seven, like I'm gonna lose an artist, like my competition is gonna get more job, uh, more works or, or whatever it is. And I'm like, I wanna be very mindful of that so that when I quote unquote make it, I, I can enjoy it. I can enjoy my journey. I can enjoy where I am. And also, this is something I was discussing with my wife the other day. If somebody works at a job that is just a job for them, like a nine to five, not this in anyone, like maybe you love your nine to five, but like if you just have a job because you have to make money, maybe you wake up in the morning, you do something you like, then it's time to go to work. And then you clock out at 5 p.m., you forget about that job till the next morning and you're enjoying your life, right? 
because we've been lucky enough to have, to have a job that is also our passion, it's very easy for that job to become your whole identity <laughs> and, like, sure, and like I and like and like cons- consume you. And being a mix engineer for the longest time, like I was Fernando, I'm a mixing engineer, and that is true. But being a mixing engineer is not everything I am. It's mm. just a part of who yeah. I am. You know what I mean? And and I don't want to lose sight of that. I don't want to abandon relationships mm. or don't don't nurture the ones I have. I don't wow. I don't want to like not have time for my family, for my friends. I don't want to like not have time to just be with my wife just because I'm in the studio. And I obviously want to be successful, but like if that means working five days a week on more normal hours and maybe I will lose a few clients because of that, but I will be more fulfilled in my personal life, then I'm okay with that, you know? A hundred percent, man. It, it's so interesting that you say that now because literally this morning, three or four, four hours ago, I was, I was thinking very much along the same lines um, in the sense that like, you know, talking like, for example, income being like, oh, you know, I, I want to make more money, say, right? Of like, course. That never ends. You know, I, I've never. met people and I've met people that like, you know, make a lot of money and they're still looking to make more. And it's, you know, I've been one of the prayers in my life has literally been just to, to, to be, learn to be content with where I am, because where I am today is, is farther than I was yesterday, you know, and it's like kind of like you said, in the sense that like we you know i i tech, yeah i have very similar goals to you as a music you know I'll put on the music, musician side right you know but like in the end there's always something else you know okay you play madison square garden for a night cool well like harry styles just played it for 15 nights so what are you gonna go for 60 yep. like, there's always something else right um whatever the case is you know like wembley in, in the uk you know oh i played wembley that's huge well ed sheeran played it for three in a row you know like there's always more to do. And it's like learning to be content with where you are while also driving, yeah. you know, striving for the next thing. But it, it all starts with today because, you know, today I'm farther in my career than I was a year ago or five years ago. It's really, really, really interesting. It's something I, I personally found thinking a lot about is the fact of like, you know, a lot of what I do is YouTube. And I, I remember being on the other side of YouTube, you know, having zero subscribers and be like, oh my gosh, man, I just... You know, of course, I have these huge goals, but like part of getting to that huge goal is, oh, I just I want a thousand subscribers on YouTube. Like that guy's life must be so cool. You know what I mean? And like yeah. I, I've passed those milestones, and it's like so easy to forget that I kind of to some degree have something that I wanted back then. You know, because I'm all, I'm 100%. still looking at that next thing, and it, it's just very very fascinating. So I very much relate to what you said, and I very much agree it's, with what you said. It's it's the same for me, and like I think you hit a very important point where like being content with where you are doesn't mean mm. being being like mediocre or like or like don't striving for the next thing or keep pushing yourself to be better it just means enjoy what you've what you've you know where you are right now enjoy what you've been able to achieve so far because like when i first moved to the united states to study audio engineer engineering 10 years ago i would leap out to know the career that i've had <laughs> so far for sure man but, but it's very easy to be like oh, man like you know why am i not there why am i here i why hear am I not you there? man oh my gosh it's 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 very hard to quiet in your mind but it's it's the, it's, it's the yeah. truth but it's very hard to quiet that for sure and i'm consciously being like a, shut up shut up <laughs> it's a constant uh mind training it's constant yeah. work through I don't know whatever yeah. works for you if it's meditation if it's walking in nature whatever it is just working in working in it every day it's yeah fundamental absolutely man I, I relate to that very much well i definitely want to be respectful of your time i know that you're working on some great mixes but one way i like to end all of these conversations and it's a tough one because you just dropped some bombshells of knowledge right there you know like some that's some you dropped some good stuff <laughs> Um, but I, yeah. I, I like to, I want to keep the consistency of it essentially is, is I ask this question at the end of every interview saying, what is something that you know now in your career that you wish you knew when you first started? That's a good one. That's a good one. I have to think about it for a second. Uh, it very well could something be what you I just said though too. That, that w- that's what, that was sort of what I was leaning towards. Like, yeah. I think if I, if I rephrase it to like, what would I tell myself when I first sure. landed that first internship? 
it would be don't try to rush things. You are mm-hmm. you are exactly where you need to be at that point. Just don't try to pretend being something you're not. Just be you, be authentic, put in the work, put in the effort, put in the time, and things will happen. You know, you you will be where you need to be at that point in time. You're not there yet. So enjoy where you are where at that point in time because when you move forward that time doesn't come back Mm. so if you look at if you look back at it i hope you will look back at it with fondness and not with not enjoying it enough because you were too worried about where you wanted to be to not enjoy where you were the dagger to my heart man i hear that (laughs) i hear it so much man it's so true because i was literally thinking about that this morning and it was you know so i relate to it it's very timely conversation for me (laughs) good reminder and you know i I feel like it happens that's how it happens regardless of what you believe like in if you believe in like attracting things in the universe with like positive thoughts or like some sort of spirituality or whatever like if we would have had this conversation like a year ago maybe it wouldn't have been this way maybe it would have been more technical or something like i i've been through some stuff that's made me change my way of thinking and i had a, i happened to have a conversation very deep conversation with a close friend of mine who's a music producer who was going through some stuff in his life a few days ago so it's like and now i'm having this conversation with you <laughs> so it just it just flows when when it needs to flow when it's right it just it happens you know yeah man i mean you said you said to quote you you said it you're right where you need to be so just to and you'll get where you're going just enjoy the process so what a, yeah. pheno- what a phenomenal uh way to, to wrap up the conversation so if you could hang out for 30 more seconds i mean i want to i want to first of yeah. all thank you uh, very much for being a part of this conversation so definitely everybody that's watching go check out all the stuff that uh fernando is up to these days all the mixes all the all the things that he has his hands on uh definitely go check him out yep. all, all his links will be uh in the description below so you can check out his instagram or his website all the stuff and if you are a musician definitely consider hiring fernando <laughs> if your schedule is not my, already full i don't manager. know yeah exactly <laughs> that, that being said there's always time go to my website hit up my manager you know to make some music sure. for sure man let's bake that cake for sure <laughs> but that go. being said there you go I also want to thank you as the viewer very much for, for sticking around to the end of this interview. You guys that stuck it and watched the whole thing or listened to the whole thing, whatever platform you're on. Uh, you guys are the true ones. Thank you so much. Best way to support this channel or whatever platform you're listening to is checking out my own original music. I'll see you guys in the next one. Go check out Fernando's stuff. God bless and peace out.